All right, so uh, we're going to continue in Job. We've got uh, three weeks left uh, of our study, uh, Shattered uh, Hope Among the Pieces. And uh, last week, we uh, looked at Job and uh, Job's kind of final rebuttal uh, of his three friends. And then uh, starting this week, uh, Elihu uh, will be introduced to us, who's been sitting on the sidelines waiting for his turn. Uh, we may say patiently because he did wait for the three friends and Job to, you know, conclude their discourse after 25 or so or 30 or so chapters, but uh, we can tell from Elihu's uh, comments that uh, he was not waiting patiently, uh, so we'll get to that in a minute. Um, one interesting outcome from this uh, is that through this, uh, Job especially has been waiting for an answer, waiting for a word from God, waiting for some sort of um, reason uh, for this. And, you know, his friends have continued to say there are certain reasons and he continued to deny them. And, you know, I, I think a very important uh, piece of the puzzle of suffering and difficulty for us is uh, sometimes we just put so much hope that an answer will come uh, and it may not come for a while and sometimes it never comes because of the nature of suffering because there is simply evil uh, in this world. Uh, but Job will eventually get an answer, um, probably not the one that he wants, and, uh, but it is an answer. And so we'll get to that uh, next week when God uh, does start talking. Uh, but uh, commercial break, Christina, are you on? I am on. Happy birthday. Happy Thank you. Birthday. Yes. Thank right. you. You're welcome. You, Good to see you. All right, so uh, continuing on this. So uh, just as I was doing some uh, study over the week, uh, I'm going through Romans and came across Romans 11 and just, uh, wow, uh, what a uh, perfect passage from the New Testament to reflect what we've been going through and will continue to go through Job. Uh, Romans 11, 33, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. I mean, that's one thing that continues to pop up. Um, we don't understand, and Elihu is going to talk about that too. We don't understand, no human can really understand the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, and uh, there is um, arguably a judgment going on here. There is something, some growth that Job needs for sure, but it's not a judgment because of major sin. And his past beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Um, who has ever given to God that God should repay them? Far from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So that's a, a good, you know, segue into Elohu joining the conversation. So Elohu's uh, a, a younger man, and he's going to talk about that in his, the large introduction. He gets a, a much more significant introduction to the introduction than the other three friends, which is very interesting. Uh, he actually is going to have uh, four uh, discourses or four um, complaints, if you will, against Job, whereas the most that the other friends had were three. And so it's a really interesting situation how he pops up here. And so Elihu has been there for a portion. We don't, we, it doesn't seem like he showed up in the uh, beginning for the seven days of sitting quietly because he's not mentioned. But at some point, he shows up and observes uh, the interaction between the four of them. And so verse 1 says, So these three men stopped answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Uh, and so one of the complaints Elihu is going to mount against the three friends is that their arguments were incorrect, that they kind of lost the debate, and how can you just allow Job to continue uh, on this path that he's on. And so that's Elihu's beef. And uh, then he is going to 
uh, and actually uh, pretty correctly uh, speak uh, some truths about God. And so um, I want to get back to that phrase, righteous in his own eyes in one second, but verse two, but Elihu, son of Abarakel, the Buzzite of the family of Ram, became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. And so these phrases are interesting to me, righteous in his own eyes and justifying himself rather than God. And I just want to try to chew on that. Okay, so Job is innocent. We saw that in the first two uh, you know, chapters, but no man is innocent. Uh, he, he does have um, not a complete understanding of God, but putting him aside for the rest of us, in what ways do we as humans justify ourselves instead of God? I mean, what, what, is, what is the scripture saying with that, that comment there, justifying himself or justifying ourselves instead of God? Thoughts on that? Or masters at rationalization. It's good, Don. Other thoughts, or is that one just too deep for uh, nine ten in the morning? <laughs> If it's too early in the morning. Could be. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question, but yeah, it is deep. I think basically, Don, what is correct that we try to rationalize things or think God couldn't possibly have meant this, mm -hmm. you know, even if it's, you know, something really clear or that was then and this is now. We, we always rationalize things, but it's a, it's a, very good question to meditate on and think about, but it's hard to come up with something like this. <laughs> okay, well then, meditate as we continue. Uh, so verse three, because there will be a couple more like that coming up, so uh, hopefully that was a, a good warm up. Uh, verse three, he was also angry with the three friends because they had found no way to refute Job and yet had condemned him no way to refute him, and yet had condemned him. Now Elihu had waited before speaking to Job because they were older than he, but when he saw that the three men had nothing more to say, his anger was aroused. And uh, so that's what we see with Elihu. He's a younger man, uh, so he uh, allowed the three older, uh, and he's going to talk about wisdom here, older, wiser men, to have their debate with Job, and he kept his mouth shut. I mean, that was a cultural thing. He allowed, um, you know, the elders of the community to have their discussion. But once there was an opening, once there was silence, once he saw that uh, Job had won the debate, even though, you know, I'm sure Job isn't thinking of this as a debate. He's just um, trying to speak of his innocence to his friends. Uh, because he's going through a difficult time. But once that has happened, uh, he uh, feels it is his opportunity to speak. And as I said, he is going to have the longest uh, discourses of the four against Job. And so uh, this was just an interesting one. And I know I've done this in my life when I've kind of built a case against someone or have just, you know, there's something wrong here with this and I can't believe this. And then uh, I go and, you know, communicate that case against an individual and then it completely falls apart. And I realize that they're innocent and that I was wrong, but have I ever continued to condemn them anyway, because I was already on that path and I didn't want to, uh, I kind of gave into my pride and allowed me to keep going and I guess make a bigger fool of myself. So, uh, any thoughts on that particular one? I mean, that's another one. <laughs> no way to refute Job, and yet they condemned him anyway. Am I the only one who resonates with that? No. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jerry. Good. I feel better. <laughs> Dick always has said in the past, 
say that? Don't confuse me with the facts. So in other words, um, even though, never mind, I lost my thought. <laughs> I think again sometimes we go with feelings and maybe you think something is wrong but you you feel like something's wrong and then you get the fact but you still have this deep feeling it's not right I'm not sure it's, yeah. it's, it's a hard it's a hard question it's a hard thing to um, come to terms with but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, where I'm thinking of you, you get put so much effort into something, you know, they're wrong, they've done something, they've wronged me. Um, I know it emotionally. Um, and here's like a fact, maybe it's something I can use in my case. And then um, once I find out that that fact is not true, um, I can, back to Don's point, we can rationalize everything and I just keep going, well, there must be something there and I'm just going to keep, <laughs> keep going with it. Scott, can you hear me? Yes, Jerry. Okay. My thought uh, when thinking about what we're talking about here is that we have our intellect and we have our freedom and and uh, our independence, which we value highly and often take too much pride in. Um, we honor God in recognizing that he has given, uh, given us all these attributes and abilities. But we rely to sometimes, at least I do, rely on my own abilities, you get it. intelligence, uh, rational mind. thinking, logic, rather than a, a spiritual connection when facing a decision or a choice. Um, I don't rely on God to be involved in all those important things in life sometimes. Yeah. And it, it tends to get me deeper into um, self, serving self rather than God. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's good, Jerry. Uh, instead of relying on the Holy Spirit, we do rely on our own wisdom, the wisdom of man. Well, let's keep uh, looking. So uh, Elihu, as I said, he has these four speeches, uh, and Job does not speak uh, anymore. So Job uh, had a few chapters and kind of said his conclusion to the matter and talked about how uh, how much suffering he continued to have. And we talked about how uh, maybe this was even more difficult, you know, and I know losing your whole family and all your wealth would be incredibly difficult, but losing your status, having people walk by you and spit on your face and mock you and just, um, I mean, he's going through the whole gamut of things. And so he, he's ended uh, his uh, rebuttal at this point. And then, as I said, Elihu is going to fill up many chapters and he sets the stage, as we'll see with his last comments, for God to speak. And it's, it really is beautiful as you watch the transition from the understanding and wisdom of men uh, to uh, setting the stage for God to come in and uh, reveal himself in just this wonderful, powerful uh, poem, song, whatever you want to call it, for four chapters, and it's gorgeous. And so his four speeches, uh, he states, and this has come up before because visions and dreams, Eliphaz talked about it, God uses dreams and afflictions to encourage change. Uh, and so that is his basic thesis, that uh, sometimes, sometimes dreams, uh, not necessarily, you know, the dream after he had some bad food and you can't sleep, but sometimes God will utilize dreams or visions or, or suffering and difficulty because he sees there is uh, an issue that needs to be deal to be dealt with, and he uh, wants people to get right. And so that there is truth in his statement. Some of what he says uh, maybe is a little off base, but there's truth in that basic statement. Uh, Elohim reminds us that uh, God governs the world in justice. And 
you know, it's a beautiful picture. God is the judge. He is the ultimate judge. Uh, what he does is right. Sometimes we are not going to understand uh, uh, his actions. Um, as that Romans passage said, we don't understand his wisdom. Um, human beings cannot affect God either by their sins or by their righteous acts. In other words, God is steady. Uh, he does not move with the wind. And um, I mean, frankly, anything that we do doesn't surprise him. Um, and lastly, God disciplines those in need of discipline, sometimes with suffering and prepares the way for God, sorry, uh, God to speak by contemplating divine glory manifested in a thunderstorm. And so as he builds his case, he's going to start saying, and then God will interject sometimes. And when he interjects, at least in this case, it's going to be in a powerful, powerful way. And so be careful what you ask for. You wanted an answer. You know, can you really come into the presence of God and receive an answer? And are you ready, really ready for the answer? And honestly, in this case, there is no answer. Okay. God speaks up. God answers in the way that he wants to answer, but it's not an answer that any of the five human beings uh, are necessarily expecting. And so that is, you know, chapters 32 through 37 of the four speeches from Elihu. And so just um, a little bit more about Elihu, uh, and then we get into some of his discourse. So Elihu, son of Barakel, uh, the Buzzite, said, I am young in years and you are old. That is why I was fearful, not daring to tell you what I know. Um, I think it can be very dangerous and to uh, say with surety on some of these types of topics that you know. Yes, I know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, God is judge and the Holy Spirit works in us. Um, but, you know, be careful with saying this is what I know, uh, because sometimes experience may not uh, be, uh, <laughs> you know, fully from God. Verse 7, I thought age should speak, advanced years should teach wisdom, but it is the spirit in a person, the breath of the Almighty, that gives them understanding. Amen to that. Uh, as we've looked at before in Job, there is a lot of New Testament understanding uh, that we don't often see in the Old Testament. And, you know, this is another statement like that. And it's really a beautiful statement because that word breath there, he's alluding back to Genesis one and two in the creation of humankind, how we mankind receive that special breath, um, that spirit, that animation, and that we need to rely on the spirit in a person. And this, you know, it's debatable, um, depending on what scholar you talk to with regards to spirit, but this seems to be an understanding of the Holy Spirit of God uh, working in an individual's life. And it's just a beautiful, very true statement for sure. All right, so now I wanna throw out some of his uh, comments uh, and then ask for a comment as we go through this. And so he says, I'm full of words, as we can see from having five chapters, and the spirit within me compels me. So remember, I, I wonder how patiently he's been sitting. Yes, he's been sitting. He hasn't said anything. He's held his tongue. That's been good. But you can tell that he's got this bottled up uh, emotion, bottled up words he has to say. And so that's what he says. I can't hold it back anymore. Here we go. And so inside, I am like bottled up wine, like new wine skins ready to burst. Uh, and so the imagery is, um, you know, the wine skin, because of what it's made out of back then, was made to be flexible enough to fill, 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 fill. But even at some point, if you put too much wine or liquid into that, it is going to burst. And so that's what he's been feeling. You know, like every time he's heard something from Eliphaz or one of the others, and he's like, ah, I can't believe they said that. But he's kept it within him, and it's totally bottled up. And so he must speak to find relief for himself 
I wonder. I must open my lips and reply. I will show no partiality, nor will I flatter anyone. In other words, I'm just letting it happen. I don't care who I offend. Here we go, which probably isn't the best way to do things either. Uh, for if I were skilled in flattery, my maker would soon take me away. So his anger comes up often. He's mad at them. He's mad at Job uh, four times in two through five alone. So Elohim believes that Job has argued that he is more righteous than God, is what Elohim is going to say. All right. Now, what's really interesting is the name Elohu means he is my God. So Elohu is my God, and he feels he needs to uh, speak for his God. All right. Any, any comments on that? Was that you, Ralph? That was... Yeah, he, had, he hasn't been listening very well. <laughs> I've, well, I've, me, me. I've heard this whole study from the fact that Job is always supporting God. Yeah. Always giving God the credit. And as I look at the afterglow of that comment, it's hard for me to get on the same page as your own. Because I've read the whole thing from a different point of view. Uh -huh. well, that's kind of interesting to me. Yeah. I'm, you're doing a great job. I just, I'm, I'm having difficulty getting on the same page because of the way I started reading Joe. Yep. Sorry about that. Oh, no. Don't be sorry. It's a deep book. There's a lot going on there. There is. There, it's a tremendous book. A lot going on. Empty grandma. Hey, how, year, how many years have you been studying Joe? Uh, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's more than six readings, I can guarantee you. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And, and different approaches. We, yep. we start out with a different question than, than someone else does and come to a different conclusion. And then you hear another question and conclusion, and you, you can follow that conclusion exactly. So it's been really exciting. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's the truth. We come to every scripture with a different set of experiences and understanding. And, you know, uh, especially in some of the narrative stories, we can put ourselves into different character places depending on who we are. I mean, have I been like uh, these three friends? I would say maybe they're a bit like the Pharisees to a degree, you know, have I been that person who's been accusing and just can't believe that somebody is innocent? So, good point, Ralph. I think his response is a good lesson in the importance of delivery, because he has some good things to say, but he comes off with so much hubris and lack of tact that it's really hard to pull out the good things amongst maybe some of the not so great delivery. Well, yeah, I mean, here you are, you have, I mean, I'll say a beat up puppy dog. For lack of, I mean, he is just, he's gone through it. He's in misery. And then you're going to come at him with uh, this type of delivery. Has that ever worked in the world? <laughs> I think it's interesting too that when we look at at, at uh, Elihu, he he's he's younger, and so uh, it goes counter to what our expectation is of, of of wisdom. That wisdom is usually found in age and, and experience, and, and so when he comes on the scene, I think part of the idea with it is is that the the ability for him not to flatter is a reflection of his youth. Uh, I, I don't I don't say flatter, but maybe. Uh, maybe frame things in a, in a fashion that that experience would allow him to to do to get the same meaning across without the like you say without beating the puppy uh, and, and so uh, I think it's a human side of it we, we see that the youth of, 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 of being human uh, and oftentimes I think back on my youth as compared to where I am now and things were very much more black and white for me when I was younger and the, the years ha have, have allowed maybe some gray tones to enter in where I, I didn't see that when I was, was 25. 
And so maybe this is part of what, what Elihu is, is, is uh, expressing too, is that black and whiteness of youth, even though what he's saying is true and, and correct perhaps, uh, but it lacks, it lacks like uh, Christina said, the, the ability, the, it, it's full of hubris, it's, it's, it's full of, of accusation, it, it's not very compassionate, uh, but it's true. And, and so uh, I think we see youth speaking here and, and even what he has to say is good, it uh, it's it's from the the fount of youth that causes it to, to maybe be uh, more more harsh. Well, and I think some of it I, I don't know I don't know how young he is here because it doesn't really say he just says it's that he's younger. But um, you know when we talk about people in their early twenties, um, some of it's just brain development. Like that's how your brain is developing to help you develop your um your own sense of self and so you are very self-centered kind of for a reason i guess um, you're developing your own values you're developing your own separate sense of self from your parents and so i think sometimes we have to have a little compassion on young passionate people because they have some strengths in that in that they don't see the same barriers we see and so they're able to be more innovative sometimes, but I think it's really easy to pick on younger people when some of, you know, I think we all go through that stage because it's just part of normal brain development. Yeah. The other well, like thing you that, that I don't, I don't want to diminish it at all is the fact that I truly think that Elihu is, is filled with the spirit and speaking from yeah. the spirit when he, when he delivers this, uh, you know, so it's, it's not a case that it's just as all Elihu. It's, a, it's the spirit speaking through him. But the vessel that, it, that the spirit speaking through lacks the tact, I think, to to be able to maybe deliver the message with compassion. Yeah, yeah, because as you say, he definitely uh, is showing some understanding and wisdom that you know you might argue is beyond his years. And so, I mean, a lesson is don't write off anyone because of their age, uh, for sure. <laughs> Well, let's keep uh, working through. So just some excerpts, uh, this is from 33. My words come from an upright heart. My lips sincerely speak what I know. So back to what you just said, Randy. The spirit of God has made me. The breath of the almighty gives me life. Uh, I mean, Elihu, who, you know, he is my God. Uh, his name means he really um, seems to have a, a strong relationship with the almighty and an understanding of who he is. Um, I'm just going to keep going because of uh, time. Uh, for God does speak now one way, now another. Yeah, would, it, would we all agree with that? <laughs> God speaks one way, sometimes another way, and even to uh, us in different ways. Though no one perceives it, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they slumber in their beds, he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings to turn them from wrongdoing and keep them from pride, to preserve them from the pit, their lives from perishing by the sword. And so that, uh, what uh, God is saving man from, in this case, Job, uh, the pit comes up uh, many different times. So that place of agony, and it really, there even is a uh, eternal life thing that comes up when Elihu is speaking. Um, saving someone from condemnation is, is where he's going. Um, any thoughts on that? Because I believe 14 through 18 are, uh, it's, that's some pretty deep um, eternity theology going on. Well, Job had a clear conscience and I, Elihu, speaks sincerely and with an upright heart. He has a clear conscience about this. And that's very important. When something bad happens to you, you need to review whether it's the result of your sin or a flaw. Yet, if your conscience remains clear, it's just a terrible quandary. And you start asking yourself, well, who's right here, me or God, about what's happening? It has to be one or the other, right? One of us is in the wrong. and I don't know that it, to me that would be a way of uh, maybe a threat the pit here would be 
I start to separate myself from God. Mm -hmm. and there's a pride issue that I have too much confidence in the status of my conscience. Although I love my conscience because I think the spirit works in it. It's precious. Um, I don't know. Can we fully trust our own conscience? Well, with the Holy Spirit living within us, I'm fairly confident we can do that. I think if you sincerely ask God to, if you sincerely reflect and ask God to show you any shortcomings that maybe you have that you can any sin that maybe you're not unaware of. I don't think he would hide that from you. Well, I, I, Christina, though, I would also think, I, I agree with what you said, but I think there also has to be a, a willingness and an eyes open to see when that's revealed, because I think sometimes my conscience or my emotion or my pride um, may not be open to uh, God's answer. Right, and that's where sincerity comes in and just yeah. taking the time. Because if you just say a quick little prayer before bed and then go to sleep, you're probably not yeah. going to get <laughs> much out of it. Um, like you'd, I think you need to meditate on that quite a yeah. bit. Um, and yes, definitely be open to whatever answer you might get. Yeah. You'll learn obedience as you grow. And I think the obedience is what makes what helps our conscience be okay. It's the obedience to God. That's good, Ralph. I mean, I, I think Paul even alluded to it too. I mean, uh, it, it does seem like a con, it, it, you know, a battle that continues, um, you know, the inner versus the outer and uh, Holy Spirit versus conscience and, uh, yeah, so when you are fully obeying God and growing in your relationship and understanding of him, um, those two can meld together better. I think it too, you know, this idea of, of looking at uh, uh, the eternal aspect of it, the pit versus the temporal aspect of what Job is enduring. Uh, oftentimes, I think we, we focus on what's happening to us in the physical, and we get so wrapped up with what's going on in the physical that we lose track of, of, of the greater eternal picture that we're, we're trying to we're trying to to live into. Uh, and, and so, I, I think here it's it's a case that they're focusing so much on what's going on with Job's physical condition that uh, Elihu is reminding him of, of a greater spiritual condition that he has to be aware of. And I, I think of New Testament references, you know, where it talks about suffering and count all, all you know all suffering as joy. Uh, I'm not seeing a lot of joy in Job and his friends right now. And maybe you know Elihu is trying to drag him back into that in that framework a little bit. Yeah. Good, Randy. All right, let's keep uh, going through some of these. Uh, this one was tough for me to, to hear. Um, so this is still from 33, verse 19. Or someone may be chastened on a bed of pain with constant distress in their bones, Oy. so that their body finds food repulsive and their soul loathes the choicest meal. Their flesh wastes away to nothing and their bones once hidden now stick out. They draw near to the pit, there's that word again, in their life to the messengers of death. Yet if there is an angel at their side, a messenger, one out of a thousand, sent to tell them how to be upright, and he is gracious to that person and says to God, spare them from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom for them. We in the New Testament know what the ransom is. Let their flesh be renewed like a child's. Let them be restored as in the days of their youth. Then that person can pray to God and find favor with him. They will see God's face and shout for joy. He will restore them to full well-being. And so back to his point, sometimes God uses affliction. And, you know, I'm looking at you, Job, and what I'm seeing in 19, 20, 21, you're a mess. And God is trying to get you to change. And uh, if God is gracious enough, uh, you'll have a messenger by your side, an angel. I don't know if Elihu is actually uh, 
referring to that angel as himself, I don't know, uh, but somebody who will intercede on your behalf and then hopefully God will spare you from going down to the pit. Um, thoughts on that one? It's a bit harsh. I would, uh, I would like to put it in the context of just sharing the, the thoughts that I've gotten out of the last 10 chapters of Job. It's an extremely humbling book. Mm. Yeah. And it, it just strips away all false pride. It doesn't leave any room for false pride. Uh, it, it just reinforces the idea to me that we should never try to second guess God's motive in anything. Mm. He's got no obligation to explain anything. And to expect it or look for it is kind of a a trap of trying to make ourselves like God. The, it just seems like the extreme arrogance would be to think that God needs our approval or our permission for anything that he chooses to do. Mm. And I'm left with the thought that I have to credit to uh, Oswald Chambers in today's uh, reading. Just trust God first and trust in the outcome. I think Amen. it goes to that, that idea that, you know, God promises rescue. It's just that the rescue doesn't sometimes come in the form that we think it's going to should be in. And, and I think a lot of times we look at Job, and Job is looking at a rescue, and, and, and this speaks to a, a physical rescue. Uh, God, God doesn't necessarily promise us that on a consistent basis, so, uh, but he does promise us an eternal rescue and through his son, and so, you know, we, we take comfort in that, and it allows us to endure what goes on in the physical, perhaps, but a physical rescue is not no way guaranteed. If you've searched your heart, I mean, it seems like Job's people here are still insisting, Job, you need to repent. Um, you know, you even if you don't realize there's a sin, you probably sinned anyway, even though you don't even know it. And there, I think there were sacrifices in the Old Testament for that situation. Yeah. Um, but uh, Job, with a clear conscience, said, how can I repent if I don't even know what I'm repenting from? Um, so this insistence on repentance and maybe what we're seeing here is that um, there are times where, as Don said, where you just need to trust in the outcome. And um, with move forward and keep your relationship and trust with God. Great word, brother. Trust. I, I remember Alan and I were pretty young and we were leaving this very small congregation for um, one of our many, many moves. But it was hard for us and we kind of felt like, I felt like we should have stayed. stayed. But it's a long story. But anyways, I, you know, I was kind of going through this turmoil and things were falling into place real nicely. And some people would say, oh, see, it's falling into place so nicely. It must be what God wants you to do. And blah, blah, blah. And, but yet I was going back and forth. And um, this very uh, wise elder said to me, wherever you are, whatever you do, serve the Lord. That's what's important. You know, this, where, where we did it wasn't so as important as that we do it. And that's that trusting God thing. And I thought it was so wise. And I've stuck with that so many times because you don't always really know the answer. But the bottom line is wherever you are and whatever you're doing, do it for the Lord and serve the Lord and you'll be okay. And it brought me such peace to do that. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, the actual details of every minute decision might not be so clear to me, but I'm 
but our life should be in service to the Lord. And that's what's the bottom line. Amen. Well, here's a, a few more uh, before we uh, conclude in a couple minutes. Uh, verse 27, and they will go to others and say, I have sinned, I have perverted what is right. Back to Scott Valley's point, but I did not get what I deserved. God has delivered me from going down to the pit and I shall live to enjoy the light of life. Uh, has he sinned? You know, uh, but he has been saved. And I, I believe Job uh, would completely track with this, uh, you know, God will deliver me, or maybe he won't, uh, but I still believe in God and his mercy and grace. God does all these things to a person twice, even three times, uh, to turn them back from the pit that the light of life may shine on them. Uh, so verse 34, so listen to me, you men of under, or chapter 34, verse 10. Now listen to me, men of understanding, far be it from God to do evil, from the Almighty to do wrong. He repays everyone for what they have done. He brings on them what their conduct deserves. It is unthinkable that God would do wrong and that the Almighty would pervert justice. Uh, is that a true statement completely? In the scheme of suffering and evil in the world? That's a trick question. <laughs> That's why I said completely, Don. <laughs> Is any one of us without sin? If any one of us without sin, we, we, can, we, can, we can come before God justified. But the only way we do that is through Christ. And so, you know, Amen. he repays everyone for what, what he have done. Praise be to God for Christ and the grace that's offered through him. Uh, without that, uh, there is no hope. There, there is no escape of the pit. And, and so, you know, God, God provides. It's just a matter of, uh, in this circumstance, that I, it's difficult for Job, I think, to see with all the physical, the physical pain that he's enduring. So it's, uh, as we go through this, uh, Elihu asked Job uh, to speak, but uh, Job is, I think, so, I don't know, dumbfounded or uh, believes it isn't worth speaking or maybe is in his mind going, yes, I, I believe, I understand what you're saying. I, I totally know God is just, but Job doesn't say anything. Uh, you know, and then he, uh, Elihu says, Job speaks without knowledge. His words lack insight. Oh, that Job might be tested to the utmost for answering like a wicked man. To his sin, he adds rebellion. Scornfully, he claps his hands among us and multiplies his words against God. Uh, verse 35, do you think this is just? You say, I am in the right, not God. And I think back to your point, Randy. Um, I believe Job has said, I am right, I am innocent, but I don't think he's ever said, but God's not right. I believe he has fully trusted God, even though it's been difficult. Um, verse, uh, Job 36, but now you are laden with the judgment due the wicked. Judgment and justice have taken hold of you. And in fairness to Elihu and the three friends, and even Job, they don't have chapter one and two. We do, um, but they continue to throw those, you know, accusations out there that Job is wicked and has done something terrible. Uh, but then, now we start to get in, okay, but how great is God beyond our understanding? The number of his years is past finding out. We can't fathom God. True, we need to understand this. Um, back to Don's point, uh, trust and then he starts to, we start to see this shift coming, and there's this beautiful piece of poetry um, kind of getting us ready for God to enter. His thunder announces the coming storm. Even the cattle make known its approach, and his words are going to be in this mighty storm. Now, if we look at the Old Testament, there are times where God comes in a gentle breeze or something like that. It isn't always in a thunder storm or in this massive wind storm or something like that but that goes with 
you know, the four friends and their God is going to come down hard on you, Joe, because of what you've done. And God is going to speak. Um, verse, uh, chapter 37, verse 24. And so this is kind of the, the conclusion of the speech before God comes in. And I use the NASB here because I love the, the way it was stated. Therefore, men fear him. Indeed, all the wise of heart see him. And then I just remember Proverbs 9, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so wisdom is going to speak for the next few chapters. And it's one of the most beautiful um, poems, uh, most beautiful words ever stated, I think, uh, in all of humankind. Uh, those words that God uh, says to reveal himself. And it's wonderful. And so um, I know we already read this before, but for next week, uh, reread uh, God's response. And that's where we're going to spend some time in that beautiful, you know, passage that is so nice to meditate. And then uh, the following week on the 14th, then we're going to, you know, see what happens after all this, after God talks, but doesn't necessarily answer. And then starting on the 21st, uh, Christian will be teaching uh, four weeks using uh, Zoom uh, to talk about prayer. And that's where we are going. Uh, any final closing comments? I know we have to end, so some of you can start the drive over here. I'd like to pose a question for us to think about. When someone comes to us with severe problems and illustrating their suffering because of the problem, or maybe as a, an observer or someone close to us, we see tremendous suffering um, and interact with that person, what should we do? I think we have read today where the initial assumptions were off base and the responses were motivated by that initial assumption that Job had sinned and is continuing in sin. And although correctly intentioned, his friends, based on the erroneous assumption, gives him give uh, gives him all kinds of advice on uh, what to do and how to react and clean up his life, etc. When we're dealing with someone else who has severe problems and is undergoing severe suffering, what should be our approach? How should we carry through with attempting to help them? I think the friends were right in their initial response. They sat with him for like a week. Mm -hmm. Yes, they that's sat true. and kept their mouth shut. And I think that's what we need to do more often than not is to just be with them um, without sharing our opinions of things. And I think in their responses that they had spent more time focused on who God is and less time on their opinions of what Job has done their responses may have come off better because all of them had some wisdom in their answers, but I think they turn that wisdom as justification for attacking their friend or even not, not necessarily attacking, but judging him. A contemporary commentary on what you and Jerry have just shared uh, comes from the ethics of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who said that, in his view, humans stand at a point of transition toward God reality. In their penultimate state, people act according to nature. In their ultimate state, people act in God reality as manifested in Jesus Christ. In the, face, in the face of death, for example, people act according to nature 
express a silence of helplessness. And in their God reality, people express consolation. Both stages are necessary for the full experience of humanness, which takes place in a social context. Well, I really believe that Christina hit upon the solution to our inner, our human interaction with people with severe problems and undergoing severe suffering. But it requires a lot of discipline not to jump in and try to solve their problems for them. And uh, she's right. Initially, they sat and listened and just spent time with him. But I guess the lesson that I'm getting out of the study of Job is that they should have continued in that mode and reinforced um, the fact that God will, God is in control, God will make good come out of bad, and all the principles that, of course, we understand fully now. Uh, but that, that discipline not to jump in and try to solve another person's problems and immediately try to relieve suffering is a good lesson to, to take from, from what we're doing here. Oh, thank you, Jerry. Well, folks, it is uh, five till. Uh, we need to end this session for today. Uh, we'll see you all on Zoom next week and uh, see some of you in a half hour or so. So, blessings. Bye. Bye. Hey, be happy. There he is. Rakeem. Okay. So they're not live streaming, are they? <laughs>